So welcome to my Olivetti M24. Uh, this is from the late 80s. Um, I bought this a couple of years ago. It's got a 10 megabyte Olivetti OPE hard disk in it. Um, they were famously unreliable, these hard disks. Um, but amazingly, this one still works. Seems to be running MS-DOS 3.3. Um, that looks like an aftermarket uh, DOS. Uh, generally, the, the proper DOS for these machines was always uh, Olivetti MS-DOS. Um, I'm not sure who Alan is. Uh, I'm not quite sure the history of this machine. But um, interestingly, there's a lot of uh, documents and data that are still on there. So we'll have a little look through those and... Uh, see what uh, interesting letters this uh, previous owner had on there. It's running a GoTek USB floppy disk adapter. I still have the original five and a quarter inch floppy disk for it but um, I don't have any five and a quarter inch floppy disks and I don't have any way of uh, any, any way of getting the data on or off of it so I've replaced the uh, floppy disk with the GoTek um, so I can get get flop get software off of our software archives, and get things on and off the machine. It's got the original amber screen. Um, these this is monochrome. You can have them in amber or green for memory. This is an amber one. Um, base unit is typical Olivetti, quite stylish, very very well made, very very solid, um, really good keyboard this keyboard probably weighs for you know three or four kilos easily um, really very well made it's a little bit sticky it needs it needs taking to bits and a bit of a cleanup but um, I'll use it as it is for now um, but I remember this machine when I was probably 16 years old back in 1986 and um, it was a modern marvel back then. We were still dealing with mini computers and um, you know tape, dry, tape, tape, uh, paper, paper tape driven machines and big reel-to-reel eight-inch tape based machines. So this thing was really cutting edge back then and um, highly desirable. So we're going to have a look at some of the software that's on it. So Alan was the previous owner of that. Um, let's have a look. Now this um, it's got a copy of Auto Root on it. Set your focus up a bit. Yes, I'm in the manual. Manual focus. So Auto Root back in. The late 80s and 90s was something to behold. Um, the fact that you could type in a journey. So if I type in report diagonal, spacebar sticking. Croyd Bay, which is my favourite place in the UK. Um, so we can say whether I want to stop anywhere. Options. Whether I want to, whether I like motorways, A roads, B roads, changes of roads, and then quickest. Quickest, shortest, what have you. Set how fast your car goes. So, uh, welly, <laughs> put that one on there. And you tell it to calculate. So, let's see how long it takes to calculate the journey, about 200 mile journey across the UK. And now you can probably appreciate so for us back in the uh, in the 80s the fact that you could go onto a computer and it would work out the route and tell you where to go was something amazing and like you know you can see this is taking what 30 seconds to figure it out um, 
and we tended to use this as a bit of a benchmark um, as computers got faster and faster so this is an 8086 but as we went on to 286s and 386s um, it was um, when, it, when, it, when you could like do an auto route journey it would take like 10 seconds to do it and then 5 seconds and a couple of seconds that's how you knew computers were getting faster and faster and obviously we have the power of this inside our um, mobile phones nowadays uh, look how long it's taken to draw that screen <laughs> painfully slow but again this was um, this was an interesting uh, development back then let's try and zoom in a bit and that was about as detailed as it got um, for memory um, it, it it was supported in colour but really all it would just show you is the route that you were taking and it would be in a particular colour you certainly didn't have anything like Google Earth or um, you know any any more detail than it is now um, I think how you move now. Oh, was that? You go down. I see you move that. This did actually support a mouse. I don't have a serial mouse. So this will support. But uh, yeah, you can see how uh, painfully slow. But it was. Um, this was considered quite quite a thing back then. So it's A361, so it's taken the right journey. That's the way I would go there. Zoom in a bit. F6. You're going to Barnstable. But yeah. Let's see if we can zoom in any further. It's very, very blocky. <laughs> but uh, this was the the state of the art back then this was something to behold it's all very impressive but now it's uh, almost laughable so let's come out of that I think this would um, yes it would give you the everything you need to do look how long it's, <laughs> it takes to uh, draw the screen Right, let's come out of that. We have PW. So this is a piece of software called ProWrite, which is a word processor software. Um, what's quite funny, even from years ago, this is the guy, whoever owned this computer, it's still got his files on there. Mr. Mr. Blight, and then this man. Um, from from the letters that I've read on this computer, um, he seemed to be a. I'm not going to say a serial complainer, but um, a serial letter writer. Um, absolutely uh, hilarious. Uh, to get a file. Um, he's even got his CV on here. You know, it's quite quite surprising that even from back from nine, 1994, this gentleman's CV, where he worked, his schools, his phone number, everything, all of his data is still on this machine. What, 20, 25 years later? Nearly 30 years? Um, yeah, it's quite... Um, and he's applying for a job here. Um... Yeah, he's going for a job at a boys' end, boys' school, uh, and what's all of his qualities for it? So, yeah, quite uh, quite surprising. There's some hilarious ones on here, though. Um, complains to the um, complains to the cat or dogs. Here we are. I don't think. I, to be honest with you, the guy was about. Six, mid 60s um, I've worked out it'd be about 95 years old by now so 
I don't think he's I don't think he's even alive anymore unfortunately but um, the the language that's used in these um, emails um, it's absolutely hilarious I used to have an old boss that what I, I used to talk in what I would call long silly words Whilst proceeding the local library yesterday afternoon, I saw a, I saw a woman male companion, each le leading a small dog. The woman's dog stopped to perform its functions on the pavement. As I was passing, I quickly and courteously drew her attention to this fact. I found myself subjected to the quantity of verbal excreta punctuated her magically, I can't even expletives, far in excess of her beloved pooch. When I was abled, I informed her, still politely, but I was against, it was against the law to allow any despoiling of the pavements and that there was a notice, I believe out of date in terms of the amount of top fine, to this effect. But fix the lamppost. And this guy just goes on and on and on and on and on. And um, it's all, um, all, all super polite. There's another letter about dogs. So he's written to the uh, council yet again about... Um, Moaning about dogs. Oh, triple print. This one's funny. <laughs> so he complains to triple print. This is where you used to take your film out of a camera and post it away and then develop your pictures. I received my prints last order today with your credit note for £2.99 pence. Two pence. I'm naturally disappointed that one of my films, as you had informed me, as I had not been exposed. And he sits there going on and on and on. I've been a triple print customer for some time and generally I've been very happy with the service. However, the double set of prints of the correctly exposed films are very, very dark. They are saying, and he goes on and on. And um, please develop and I've enclosed some money in a cheque and dirty, dirty, dirty. I've been a long term customer of yours and I would like you to do this. This is like, oh God. Uh, Southwest Water, I think. This is talking about the drains, I think. So now he's like writing to the the dra uh, the the, uh, the water company, complaining about um, uh, yeah the, the sewage problems in his road, an unsavoury task of trying to paddle through the mess, and I've had to clean it all up. And, uh, and some of these letters he goes I'm not a serial complainer and I'm thinking yeah you are it's like every single letter is just complaining about something um, what's the gas one uh, so now he's moaning about the, um, the gas engineers Although I waited at home all morning and no one turned up consequently I rang the Orpington office for an explanation the young lady who I spoke Miss Louise Hyde informed me that the required replacement part had been ordered, but there was no record of any arranged revisit. I'm aware of this is like blah 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 blah. So yes. Oh, here it is, Gillette. This is it. This must be it. <laughs> so he writes to Gillette, complaining. So this is in '97, 1997. So he's obviously. Um, I've got letters going back to 94, so I think you got the computer in 94, but now he's like up to 97 now. And um, he's taken it upon himself to um, moan about... Um, so yeah, some 10 days ago I purchased at the Gravesend branch of Boots, the chemist, an aerosol can of Gillette shaving gel. I had cause to return the can and what was left of its contents on Friday last. The problems encounter were as follows. I had great difficulty in removing the cover which fitted very tightly over the pressed down top. Initial twisting of the cover in an attempt to remove it was ineffective. It required excessive leverage using a hand towel to obtain grip to remove the cover. I have mild arthritis and a couple of fingers in my right hand, in my right hand but much greater problem could be Im imagined for a person afflicted with a greater degree. I found on removal of the cover that the gel had seeped around the top of the can and into the cover. I persisted for two or three days with the towel and leverage method, wiping away the surplus gel. But then I found the press down top had become fixed and gunged in the cover of the can, <laughs> leaving the tube insert. Oh God, he just goes on and on and on. Um, 
And then he, he takes it back or something. I was received with utmost courtesy. The lady, so he, he moans about it, and he takes it back to Boots. I was received with the utmost courtesy by the lady's sister, the Gravesend branch of Boots, and she accepted totally my account of what had happened. Without demur, she would give me a full refund of the price of my purchase. Ooh. You, uh, where is it? You may be wondering, then, why I've bothered to write to you on this matter. Past experience in the design and quality assurance departments of a large company, company has taught me value to value customer liaison and feedback. So, I'm, so, so may I, with respect, suggest that the design of this particular aerosol can cover and its possible effect on gel extrusion should be re-examined. Aesthetically, it is pleasing. But, far, but from a practical standpoint, particularly for someone more physically handicapped than I, cover removal and its possibility resulted in So yeah, I don't know, does he go on to tell him what they need to do? So yeah, he walked, went into boots and told him, so yeah. <laughs> Guys, there's just letter after letter after letter. Angling, there it is. So yeah, he's... um. This one is him having a moan up about his new conservatory. So this is 1993. So yeah, nearly, that's 27, 27, 28 years ago. The brick-based conservatories. Within hours of completion, we found that very loud cracking noises came from the roof structure. I reported this matter, informing anglers Mr. Clark at Mesa and Mr. Walker at Sittingbourne, and told them this was initial problem. And then he like goes on to moan about people coming out and doing, doing bodge repairs on it. We're in focus still. I've been informed that the problem has been discussed between Sittenborn and Norwich offices. We now have had three visits from the fitter and repair personnel who have attempted to overcome this problem and the failed remedies have included slacking off the holding screws, changing the aluminium strip for plastic equivalent, and so on, so on, so on, so on. I've been more than reasonable in this matter. So, yeah. Mr. Word Salad, I think I'll call this gentleman. Sounds like a nice guy, but I um, can't help feeling that um, he's got too much time on his hands. Maybe in 20 years' time I'll be sitting there writing letters to all and sundry complaining about me Gillette spray. So, that's that. So it's a little video I'm going to show you inside my Olivetti M24. Uh, I'm actually going to use the original tool that was given to me uh, when I started at Olivetti uh, in 1986. I've got my, I've still got all my original tool kit back from them. Um, I don't know what size this is, for 5mm. You can see how well worn that is, but I've, st I've still got all my tools back from when I was an engineer at Olivetti. So uh, anyway, I'll show you how to open these things now to get the uh, the floppy drive bay out because there's like a little hidden clip that's worth knowing about. So let's get the keyboard out of the way. All right, let's get the screen off. Interesting on these things, the, um, the screen is powered from the video adapter. It doesn't have a separate power adapter. Um, the colour screen on these is um, is self-powered, but the monochrome screen is, isn't. The keyboard off. Um, you can actually run PS2 keyboards on these. There is an adapter that takes it from this 9-pin layout. So it is actually using um, an XT80 protocol. So with an adapter, you can adapt these to um, just use an ordinary PS2 keyboard. So to get the top cover off, you undo these two screws here. Um, they are captive, so you only need to loosen it a bit. And then all you do is you go like that. 
and it comes off. Yes, this is the Olivetti OPE drive. Um, this this one hasn't got the bus expander, so this is like the, the cheapo version. So you've got the video card there, uh, ST506 hard disk controller there, but the, there is a board that goes in here to expand it so you can put more XT cards in there. Now to get the floppy drives out, or the floppy and the hard drives, you need to unclip a little hidden clip. So it slides out the front, but there's a clip that holds it in. So what you have to do is get that and bend it below the catch. Now it'll slide out. This comes out as a pair. Take the uh, power out. A very common problem was to put this power connector in upside down. Um, it's very easy to get that wrong. Um, there are, they're usually missing, but there's two screws that hold that in as well. So you can see there's the, the where you're putting the screwdriver in, and that's the catch that you're trying to clear. Um, so there's usually a couple of screws in, but more often than not, that, they're missing. Um, power supply is just held in with a screw there, and I think there's a couple of screws around the back, and that just pops off. Um, it provides uh, plus or minus. 12, what we've we got here, so there's power for the CRT, yeah, so this, this lead here is the what the power to the, that powers the CRT and then this one here is plus or minus 12 volts which is for your RS-232 basically and then just red and black which is 5 volts um, let's get this back in so this uh, hard disk is ST506 hopefully we can see ST506 uh, which is the 34 pin and then I think it's a 20 pin connector there. Let's put this back in. Trying to be relatively gentle with it. So make sure all the wires are in. Put the power back in. And then that will just go back in with a clip. That's back in again now. Right, I'll show you how to get to the motherboard. The motherboard is similar to get to the, you need to take the lower part of the case off. So that's these two screws. So again, they're captive. Um, again, let's try and be a bit more gentle with it, given it's the hard disks in there. I'll go this way. Can't beat the build quality of these things. Make sure my hard disk is steady. So again, just give it a firm pull. So this is. Um, this is a bit of history for me. So this this green label is um, it means it's been through the repair lab. Um, I think we used to call these red red labels. I know they're not physically red, but it, it means decent. It's decentralised electronic repair. Um, but that means there should actually have be a, a job number on there, and then the I think it's the month that it was repaired. So yes, yeah, so I remember putting these little yellow stickers on every single. Um, board that ever came through the lab for repair. Um, this is the processor 8086 uh, and this is the socket for the math coprocessor. Um, can't remember what that socket's for. Um, and then it's, this is a 1.21 firmware. From memory, on oh, the batteries here as well, um, so these obviously leak. Um, very very common for these things to leak. Um, physical reset button there. Um, the this is the floppy disk cable. So to remove the motherboard, you'd undo all of these screws. Um, undo all of the screws, 
undo the power screws. Let's just make sure they're nice and tight. Make sure my little bits. These sometimes come loose. Yeah. So you do undo all the screws, undo those two, and then you, you pull the board out and it will unplug from that, those two connectors. Um, 1.21 firmware is pretty old. Um, it was 1.36 and I think it was 1.43 or 1.41. I don't think you can put the firmware in without doing mods. There was always like loads of mod wires or bodge wires as they're called nowadays. Uh, and I don't think you can just put the later firmware. Um, mainly, just make sure that's in. Mainly, it just gave different tables for the hard disk. So as new and new, newer hard disks came out and um, different floppy disks, um, 720Ks and 1.2 megs, it had support for those. Just make sure everything that's on a socket is on as it's pushed in. Uh, yeah, and that's that's about it really. The old uh, baseboard um, assembly is reverse, is disassembly, disassembly. Main thing is just to make sure that you get the, um, the reset button. You don't catch that. It's quite often quite easy to catch it and end up um, it falls off. In. Put the cover back on. Um, there's, there's like little hooks here, so you're making sure these these hook into there, and you're making sure that the uh, this clips on the ins that lip is on the inside of that. So go like that. Make sure it's all in, and then just give it a bit of a nudge. Tighten them back up. And that's how you take a M24 to bits.